So as I was saying that uh, today's event is uh, the first in, uh, not the first, excuse me, the second in a series of events organized by the Council for British Research in the Levant Kenyan Institute commemorating the centenary anniversary of the British mandate in Palestine from 1922 to 1948. Uh, today's event uh, is with, as I said, Dr. Muna Dejani. Uh, she'll be speaking about thirsty water carriers and the legacy of colonialism in the Galilee. Before I introduce her, I want to say a couple of words about the Council for British Research in the Levant. Uh, we are an independent UK research charity and membership organization that exists to conduct, support, and promote humanities and social science research. We have two uh, regional offices, one in Jerusalem, where this webinar is taking place, and another in Amman. Uh, please check out our website, cbrl.ac.uk, where you can find a full listing of our activities and events. As I said, this is the second webinar in a series on 100 Years to the Mandate. Uh, we have four online lectures uh, that are on this event, as well as one in-person lecture at the University of Edinburgh, and a we are co-sponsoring a three-day conference on reassessing the British mandate with five other uh, different re international research institutes uh, assessing the British mandate era, which has 64 different uh, papers, as well as uh, two independent panels on archaeology and the role of archaeology during the mandate. So welcome, Muna Dejani. Muna is, uh, holds her PhD from the Department of Geography and Environment at the London School of Economics. Her research focuses on documenting water struggles in agricultural communities under settler colonialism. She's a senior research associate at, at the Lancaster Environment Center, where she works on the project entitled Transformations to Groundwater Sustainability, which explores promising grassroots initiatives of holistic groundwater governance shedding light on traditional intergenerational skills and knowledge. She's contributed to numerous studies on the hydropolitics of the Jordan River, Jordan and Yarmouk rivers. And she also co-led a collaboration project documenting the untold story of the occupation of the Syrian Golan Heights through developing, developing an online knowledge portal that includes local resources and personal reflections on the collective imagination, uh, uh, imaginary of historical events and the popular struggle taking place there. So with that introduction, uh, Muna, thank you very much for, for being with us today. We're very excited to hear what you have to say. Uh, the way this will be run is that Muna will provide a presentation for roughly 25 minutes or so, uh, followed by uh, some warm-up questions by myself, and then audience members are welcome to um, put their questions in the question and answer feature, at the bottom of your screen. I will be, not be checking the chat menu, but we will be checking the question and answer uh, feature. And this uh, event is also being live streamed currently on our Facebook page. So with all that said, I apologize once again for the, the small delay and the technical hiccup. Mona, can you hear me? I think you're still on mute, yes? Yes, I can hear you very well. Yeah. Fantastic. All right, so go ahead, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Tofi, for the lovely introduction and uh, for the great opportunity to be present with you today. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to be a part of this uh, very interesting seminar series. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, and again, I'm really excited to be here. It's a chance for me also to kind of uh, revisit some of the work that I have been uh, carrying out in multiple uh, roles, uh, part, of, part, of, part of which is uh, from my PhD thesis, but other parts, uh, as uh, Tofi mentioned in the bio, concern, you know, how uh, the hydropolitical baseline of river basins. So how, how are uh, waters inside river basins managed between different riparian countries? Uh, what have been the shortcomings of those? Uh, and in my interest in the research, I look, I look at the historical legacies of colonialism, uh, especially in the case of Palestine, but also throughout that uh, region of the Jordan uh, and Yarmouk River basins. Um, so I will uh, I will focus on that in my research and in, in this presentation and the time I have, uh, I'll try to kind of highlight some of the main interesting uh, uh, characteristics, let's say, of uh, this legacy of colonialism uh, left by the uh, British colonial mandate. Um, firstly, 
Uh, I want to start by speaking of transformation of Palestinian waterscapes. Orientalist environmental imaginaries in the, in the Middle East uh, and North Africa uh, in general, uh, they always frame uh, the Middle East and North Africa as a desolate and de this, this uh, degraded environment. Historically, and this historically justified various colonial aspirations to modernize, to restore and, and improve the land, the water and the people. Uh, to make it to make to make the people and the land uh, more productive, more efficient, and more modern. Palestine, of course, has been no except exception. Uh, according to D Diana Davis, uh, John Broish, uh, racism as well was at the heart of those British water policy making in in Palestine. So the idea that depictions of Palestinians or Arabs has always been backward in their agricultural and water management. Uh, techniques uh, and expertise. They did lack knowledge, ingenu ingenuity, and entrepreneurship to develop and become modern. The Jews and the Zionists, on the other hand, were seen as count as as sometimes sometimes even equal counterparts to development. Uh, and although they didn't, of course, see eye to eye uh, most of the time, but uh, uh, but that was the case. Uh, Arabs, therefore, were mere beneficiaries of modernist projects uh, of water development in Palestine uh, and also sources of uh, cheap labor in some of those projects, but not all. But always it has been led by the British uh, colonial powers and Zionist uh, entities and actors. Um, so with that in mind, those modernist projects, especially in the water, water development sector, uh, have facilitated a complete transformation in what, what we describe in the geography as waterscapes. These are water landscapes that we'd like to study and, and understand from a very political perspective, from a historical perspective, and from a societal perspective, to look at different changes and transformations that these water landscapes undergo. And what do these uh, changed and altered waterscapes uh, actually change in terms of how we view, how we understand our water relations to water and land, uh, and also our identity and place making. Um, okay. So between, between the late 1920s and the 1930s alone, um, according to John Broich, uh, there were over 200 water supply and reclamation projects that transformed Palestine. Over 150,000 acres uh, were being drained or otherwise altered completely. Those, as I mentioned, were actually projects that were carried out by the British mandate or through concessions that were given to most two Zionist entities. And we'll speak of a few of them uh, uh, in a bit. But one of, the, one of the interesting aspects is that people were aware that these projects were altering not only those natural resources and making optimizing their use, but they were also changing, uh, you know, these landscapes uh, um, significantly for Palestinians. Uh, this uh, caricature that has uh, that was part of um, an Arabic newspaper called Palestine uh, on the 15th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration highlights, you know, the impacts of such modernist projects in the water sector. And what, what, how they favor, how the favoritism of uh, of Zionist projects, giving uh, concessions only to Zionist uh, entities and actors, had uh, dire implications on Palestinians, their belong, their their access to resources, uh, and their uh, their their um, perseverance on the land. At the heart of it was the Balfour Declaration, but we all know that was just the impetus and the start of uh, a very extensive uh, development uh, and modernist uh, project uh, that uh, happened pre-48. Um, in terms of water policy uh, development, the, tra the earliest traces of water conflict in Palestine before 48 can be traced to the British colonial mandate period as well. There were multiple studies and reports that were uh, carried out to understand, you know, the, um, the limitation and the prospects of Jewish immigration to Palestine and its implication on economic development. Simpson report of 1930, which focused on immigration settlement and economic development, provided less optimistic estimates of Palestine cultivable area and recommended legislation to be enacted to settle water rights. Although, although they were never, never settled, especially for Palestinians. 
in different uh, documents uh, in the archive, we can we can see how um, British British were, were very supportive of Jewish immigrants, of Jewish immigration, and maintained a neutral position on issues relating to water rights for Arabs. The British White Paper of 1939 is another important document that mirrored the Simpson Report and was concerned with how landless Arabs were to be provided with land, arguing that the, the Jewish agency had already acquired enough land for Jewish settlement development. So clearly, the British colonial policies uh, were, were agitating fears and concerns, especially you know, in the light of uh, continued Jewish immigration uh, and uh, the curtailment of agricultural livelihood practices of Arabs, of Palestinians uh, who live uh, in, in Palestine. So this, this made water a, a project, uh, this made water a topic of conflict and contention. Meanwhile, the Zionist investment by that, by that time in the 1930s um, was so significant that any uh, Arab or Palestinian uh, development of water was insignificant. Uh, the, the concessions that the British has given uh, to the Zionist uh, entities, such as the hydropower production on the Yarmouk River, known as the Rutenberg, uh, the Pinchas Rutenberg uh, hydropower plant, or the electrification of Jaffa, or the drainage of the Hula swamps, all of these were, were uh, drastically transforming these waterscapes and, and provide and with, with a very specific characteristics of favoritism uh, for Zionists. This is the Pinhas Rutenberg and the and the hydropower plant that was not was only operational until 1948 when it was bombed. Also, water became a site of border making, um, and this was significant. Again, we go back in time to uh, to the 1920s and all of the negotiations that have happened with Sykes Picot about where should we set where where do the colonial forces of French and British colonial forces set the boundaries and the borders and water, water played a very important role. Uh, and eventually the British actually had more access to uh, the tributaries of, of the Upper Jordan and also to uh, the Hula, uh, Hula Lake and Lake Tiberias, which were very important and significant um, water bodies where the Zionists also were pushing for these water bodies to be included in, uh, in the border of, uh, or within the boundaries of Palestine. The UN partition plan later reiterated the significance uh, of water uh, and also uh, was characterized by a favoritism of Zionist and Israeli water imaginaries. Um, in, in the borders article of the UN partition plan, emphasis was given to the Jewish agency's prior priorities regarding water for irrigation, which necessitated the inclusion of the uh, of Al Batu Valley, which I will speak about uh, as a case study uh, in within the, the Jewish state borders. So it says from this, uh, and I quote, from the southwest corner of Kufr Anan village, the boundary line follows the western boundary of, of Tiberias subdistrict to a point close uh, to the villages of Mgar and Ailabun in the heart of the Galilee, thence bulging out to the west to include as much of the eastern part of the plain of Al Batuf as is necessary for the reservoir proposed by the Jewish agency for the irrigation of lands to the south and east. So what we see evidently here is that Zionist water imaginaries and plan were therefore placed at a higher, higher priority and a higher pedestal, even in the demarcation of borders uh, for the partition of Palestine. Um, and as, as a lot of water scholars have highlighted, this actually subordinated the rights of indigenous Palestinians and handicapped them from the beginning uh, by the dominant and hegemonic Zionist uh, water, um, water sector and water imaginary. This bias of the mandate continued and helped further Zionist aims in, uh, in Palestine as well. Another important aspect that the British have left the legacy of is the idea of a unified river basin. And basically, uh, without going into a lot of technicalities, it's basically I, the idea is that we can that the riparian countries, so countries where a watershed exists, like the Jordan River Basin, can be and should be shared by those riparian states, and each will get an equal, somehow equal and uh, fair distribution of uh, of the water sources there. 
But this has actually, since uh, since uh, the inception of such a framework of understanding water, it had made the, the Jordan River and other rivers, uh, I claim as well, uh, under a curse of becoming a border. Um, later on, the British also pushed, uh, along with Americans uh, as well, pushed for a hydraulic mission, which was happening all over the world, uh, with the colonial uh, and Eurocentric uh, understanding of water that uh, the water needs to be fully optimized. There needs to be large scale infrastructure. We need to tame the natural, including uh, um, in, uh, indigenous uh, population. And the, the legacy of, of the British colonial mandate here, again, is that it also was uh, imbricated and it was until today part of uh, policymaking in, in those nation states to become nation states including most specifically Jordan, but also to, to an extent Israel uh, and uh, the Palestinians, I would claim as well. Uh, let me just check the time. Okay. Okay, so I, I come here to, to the case study that I have uh, been working on on my PhD and uh, that kind of really resonates with this idea of a unified river basin. Uh, at, at, eventually in the 1940s and in the 1950s, each, each of those riparian countries, including Jordan, Syria, and Israel started developing their own uh, their own infrastructure to to uh, claim territorial sovereignty over natural resources, and this happened, of course, with Israel through uh, military occupation and annexation of Arab lands, and also expropriation of Arab waters uh, through the control of the upper tributaries of the Jordan by occupying the, the, the Syrian Golan Heights uh, and Lebanon. It has also has had full control over those uh, tributaries. So to, for us to understand the ramification of this, the British mandate government on water policy, uh, I looked at how it affected the populations that live in the Galilee. So this is a different approach than we're usually taking uh, from an international relation or a history perspective or a water law perspective, uh, because usually the populations are not seen as active agents in opposing or changing and transforming the realities uh, that they were that were imposed on them. Um, so. So this is where it comes to th this idea of uh, thirsty water carriers. So the idea is that uh, Israel, uh, through uh, through its uh, water projects, especially the national water carrier, which was the largest the largest infrastructure project that the Israeli state has carried out since, since its inception, which actually uh, consisted of uh, transporting large uh, sums and volumes of water from the upper tributaries of the River Jordan. Uh, and putting, uh, saving them, storing them in Lake Tiberias, continuing uh, uh, with, through a, an assemblage of pipes net and conduits uh, and canals uh, to take them to where they're needed in the, in the south for settlement expansion, making the desert bloom and settlement expansion in the Naqab. Uh, what was interesting about it uh, that I want, want to share with you today is that this guy, I want to discuss a bit about the converging and diverging imaginaries of the Batuf as a site of uh, modernization uh, and water modernization. Uh, if, if at first, Al Batuf, uh, I'll, I'll explain a bit about it. Uh, Al Batuf is a rich and vast plain in the heart of the Galilee. Um, and and uh, it is, it, is our, it consists of around 50,000 50, uh, dunams which today, until today, are, are owned almost exclusively by Palestinians who live, still live inside, uh, in, in historic Palestine inside Israel. Um, Al-Batuf has a natural phenomena of Al-Gharaq, which main, mainly is a vast, a, a vast flooding of around 15,000 dunams uh, that happens during the rainy season. Al-Gharaq, in that sense, Al-Gharaq is, pl is a place of, of waste. Uh, for the British and for the Zionists, this idea of uh, a wasted space was very much in, at the heart of uh, development. So, um, so during the British mandate, the district commissioner of the Galilee district received a letter from T.L. Ward, who was pushing for the drainage of Al-Battuf. 
and was discussing with the director of public works uh, the estimates and cost of dust. The drainage scheme, he explained, if executed, would prevent the flooding, which occurs almost annually at the eastern end of the depression. And as a result, you know, tens of thousands of dunams of good land is, is, is becoming useless in the winter. These plans uh, that they wanted was for drainage uh, of those plants. And what is interesting about you know, the British uh, colonial, uh, for, uh, colonial uh, government officials is that they thought of drainage as you know, a, a way to, uh, to enhance the economic situation of all residents of, uh, of the British mandate, at least, to depoliticize and de-escalate any Palestinian or even Zionist uh, opposition of water projects. So the idea is always to kind of frame it as an economic development uh, project. So for, for the British, drainage was the solution to al uh, to increase, uh, to actually enhance uh, agricultural production. For the, for the, for the Zionists, it was actually uh, the opposite of that. Uh, the, initial, the initial plan was for the Zionists to actually submerge the whole of al to, to act as a storage uh, facility or a storage lake for all the waters that they were diverting from the upper Jordan, from the water rich and abundant uh, north to where it's needed for settlement expansion and for making the desert bloom. So the idea was to actually submerge the whole valley, including uh, villages of Palestinian. And this is happening right after the Nakba, after 1948. This is in the 50s, where this proposal has been made by Israeli water officials. And the idea was that Kufur Manda, one of the villages that still remain until today, uh, was to be completely submerged by water. And what is interesting when we look at a lot of the archives and look at the, uh, a lot of the uh, newspaper archives specifically, is how the framing of al Batuf as a reservoir has been completely uh, um, uh, adopted by uh, the Israeli uh, discourse. So here it says in Hebrew uh, that there is a lot of riots happening in the, in the basin of al, al Batuf. The Batuf was not a basin. It was basically, as I showed you in the picture, uh, a lot of uh, 50,000 dunams of Palestinian uh, agricultural land. There were villages also in the valley, uh, like Kufur Manda. But the idea is that the imaginary, the Zionist imaginary was that it is a basin, and it is um, a basin to be developed and uh, exploited uh, for the sake of uh, making the desert bloom. So this is one thing where you see divergence in terms of how the British have seen water development uh, in Palestine, trying, as, as I said before, to depoliticize it, to make sure that, you know, everybody gets a piece of the cake in order to pacify uh, resistance and in order to pacify any opposition by uh, the, the Zionists uh, and uh, their lobby. And... Um, Yes, and, and so so this is kind of a situation where we see, you know, how water policy has been has had had a legacy uh, had had a legacy on uh, on Palestinians uh, in in the Galilee because until today, for example, in the in the heart of Al Baktouf, it remains a, um, a valley without access to water. I'm just going to go back to the picture. So it remains a valley without access to water. The national water carrier at the end of the day did not uh, submerge uh, Al Baktouf like the, the early Zionist project wanted because of tec technical uh, technicalities and reasons of uh, of drainage and hydrology. At the end, Lake Tiberias served as the storage facility or a storage lake for, for all of the water that will go down to the Naqab and to the coastal areas. But the, the Galilee still was a site of uh, uneven, what, what I termed as uneven waterscapes in the Galilee. What we see here in the picture is a, is a, is a concrete canal. Uh, this is the National, the National Water Carrier Canal where it reaches al Baktouf areas. It's an open ditch. It has confiscated thousands of dunams of, uh, of lands from Sakhnin, Agrabe, uh, villages, uh, and it has denied them access to that water. So since uh, the 1950s, uh, since the operation and the building of this national water carrier on the lands of the Galilee, until this day, uh, Palestinians are denied access to that water. And that water serves exclusively for Jewish settlement development. Uh, and for uh, for multiple reasons today that I can speak of maybe in the Q&A if somebody's interested. But I think this is a, a clear depiction of an uneven waterscape that, that is rooted in a colonial legacy. And that is rooted in like British colonial mandate uh, legislation and also uh, uh, favoritism 
of, of Zionist uh, imaginaries of land and water development while suppressing and, and disregarding Palestinian imaginaries uh, that also, that also um, uh, want to claim uh, rights to development, that also want to, to have uh, the promise of infrastructure fulfilled for them and for their agricultural practices. And I can speak about it also uh, more in uh, the Q&A as well, if somebody's interested. Uh, but this is where like, I wanted to, to end uh, my, uh, my presentation uh, and speak of an enduring coloniality. Uh, and how, how can we understand such infrastructure, whether water infrastructure or other important natural resource infrastructure as sites of uh, exploitation, as sites of uh, inequality, but also as, as, as ethnographically rich sites of investigation to better expose uh, the legacy of colonialism uh, in Palestine. Great, Mona. Thank you very much for that very interesting uh, uh, lecture. I apologize a couple of times during the middle of it. I also got kicked out. I'm having some kinds of technical difficulties. So actually, <laughs> it was a bit interrupted. So excuse me for uh, not being able to have a full coherent picture of exactly what you said. So I'm going to ask our participants who are on this webinar to send in their questions and put them on the question and answer feature. Um, I'd like to, uh, you know, I, I, as I said, I'm not, a, I'm not quite an expert on water policies here, but um, can you, I, I, can you speak to a little bit uh, how water infrastructures in the post Oslo period uh, have, uh, are, can you draw any parallels around how uh, water infrastructure have been approached, um, and. Uh, Mixed up with 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 what you said in your your presentation in the earlier period versus this more contemporary period. <laughs> great, yes, for sure. Um, I wanted to draw a lot on that, uh, but I thought the Q and A would be a great place to do it because I think uh, what we think about when we think about you know water infrastructure or water um, uh, water policy making in Palestine is a really uh, a lot of focus on the West Bank and Gaza, uh, rightly so, you know, because what's happening in, in, in there is uh, a clear example of water appetite. It's a clear ex example of uh, water injustice uh, that is systematic and that is uh, actually, as, 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 we as we have seen uh, in this uh, presentation, that actually has this legacy of uh, from colonial times. So even water policies, uh, the way that water policies have been uh, developed, by the British have been inherited somehow by settler colonial, Israeli settler colonial state. And we continue even in our post-colonial nations like Jordan, Syria, and uh, under the, the French, uh, French colonial rule. But all of us carry that legacy of uh, colonialism in our policymaking, in our uh, legislations and, and, law, and law and regulation. Um, so it continues. Uh, what happened as well, is that uh, this this was just one example that is usually not considered as an example of water injustice or an, an implication of colonialism because it concerns Palestinians inside uh, 48. Uh, and I think the important one important message uh, and the important of highlighting such cases is that they they trans they actually expose you know that. Um, um, exposed that there is a difference uh, between uh, water development in, in, in the occupied territories, West Bank and Gaza and the rest of 48 lands. Uh, so that's one, one aspect. Uh, what continued to happen you know, after, uh, after 1967 and after Oslo uh, is, a, is a continuation of this idea of technological fixes, large scale uh, infrastructure uh, that will uh, claim territorial sovereignty of nations so the Israeli settler colonial state, whether the Palestinian Authority in that light as well. So the idea is that technology will save the day, uh, that if we invest more in finding new water, that we will be able to uh, in enhance uh, the livelihoods of, of, of all of Palestinians, of uh, Jordanians, of, uh, um, of, of populations who live in the area, and at the same time, go beyond speaking about the politics and speaking about water rights, which is at the heart of the injustice, is that Palestinians are denied their water rights. And, um, and so, so 
post Oslo, we continue to see that intensified idea of depoliticization of water and also kind of a huge over reliance on large scale water infrastructure like desalination plants for Gaza, for example, like uh, 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 wastewater treatment schemes uh, and reuse schemes that are also now becoming a trend in international development uh, in the West Bank, where we actually think where actually international community is uh, is not being uh, uh, is not holding Israel accountable for its water right violations uh, there. So it kind of says, oh, let's find, and it continues along the same lines, economic development, let's depoliticize water, let's uh, invest in infrastructure that will benefit everyone and that will kind of maintain uh, some sort of peace. So this is kind of a continuation we see uh, in, those, uh, in those lines in, in the contemporary times. Yeah, thank you for that answer, Mona. Uh, again, I lost uh, uh, connection for a second, but I picked up enough at, at the end of what you've been saying uh, because it actually intersects a little bit with my own research around this, where um, I, I came to understand when I when I did my own book, actually, that, of course, a lot of the settlements are built on the water aquifer, right? And uh, a lot of aid money that was brought to the Palestinian Authority was to solve the water issue, uh, including through desalination plants, as you as you mentioned, so Palestinian water that is beneath certain villages gets taken and used by settlers, and aid money actually comes in to support desalination projects that Israel is actually desalinating and selling back to Palestinian villagers or Palestinian um, uh, water companies that sell them to the villages. Correct, something to that effect. That, definitely, yeah, that's uh, somehow true, although it doesn't seem like uh, it's shocking that it's true. Uh, so this this has been happening actually even before Israel occupied uh, the West Bank in Gaza in 1967. There has been extensive uh, expo exploitation, exploration sorry, of groundwater in the rich uh, water aquifers uh, in the West Bank. And what happened is that that was hegemony over water investment and technologies since uh, you know, since the 1930s, uh, has continued uh, unabated until this day. So Israel continues to abstract, uh, it continues to deplete the water resources in the West Bank. Uh, and also, um, as, as you mentioned, it's like uh, offering, you know, offering uh, water as a transactional, uh, as a transactional issue. So only uh, through increasing water availab availability through other means, uh, we can give it to Palestinians while the water under our own feet uh, is not, we don't have access to and we don't have control of. Uh, and this is the hegemony that endures uh, because of this colonial legacy. So there is a, a hegemony over uh, water uh, resources that is um, that Israel maintains uh, through soft and hard power. So through uh, through its occupation and through its control of of uh, the groundwater wells, through its denial of the the Palestinians to 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 build new wells and to operate new wells to go deeper into the groundwater, uh, Palestinians are not allowed to do that. While as you mentioned, the settlers do that unabated, uh, and as the settlement infrastructure water infrastructure continues to grow uh, at the expense of Palestinian uh, Palestinian uh, presence on the land because uh, as we know in Area C and in the Jordan Valley uh, the situation is so dire this man-made catastrophe is so dire that that the communities don't have enough water to to drink and this is the, uh, so the WHO and other organizations will speak about a humanitarian crisis, but uh, on the contrary, the crisis is a crisis of uh, settler colonial crisis of uh, of hegemonic control over resources and uh, and you know. Um, it's 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 a struggle over uh, uprooting. It's a struggle to uproot uh, Palestinians from their land through uh, denying them water and water rights and through also denying us the promise of infrastructure. So the promise of infrastructure comes to us very conditional uh, through the international community and through Israel. Uh, and uh, and it becomes, uh, you know, if it, it becomes really implicated in very much um, conditional aspects of uh, who gets which water and uh, which cities get what water and which don't. Um, so it's kind of a lot of intimate, uh, how do you say, intimidation tactics that Israel actually follows there. 
Thank you, Mana. So we've got a couple of questions that are popping up in the question and answer feature. I would rem remind our readers, our readers, our audience members to put them in the question and answer feature. Uh, so it's also directed at Samah, please. But uh, I'll start off with the first comment that comes from Tarak Tel, who says, he, he gives a comment and he says, to talk of, quote, national development policies with regards to Jordanian schemes in the Eastern Ghor, is surely a misnomer. They were launched with an explicit mm -hmm. aim of settling Palestinian refugees. Do you have any comments to that? لا, yeah, I, I didn't maybe have enough time to kind of exp go exp explicitly through that. Uh, but definitely, yeah, like uh, uh, a lot of these development policies that were uh, proposed, uh, in, sometimes solely by British uh, experts, sometimes in collaboration with the Jordanian, uh, uh, water expertise, even the establishment of the water authorities in Jordan were actually a, an exclusive uh, task of uh, British uh, uh, hydrologists and engineers. Uh, but definitely, yeah, it wasn't only about development, it was also about settling refugees. It was about depoliticizing uh, a, a border region that was seen to be like uh, on, on the brink of explosion again. Uh, so Palestinian refugees coming to the east uh, bank of the River Jordan settling there, but still, you know, uh, wanting to return. Uh, so the idea was that economic, again, economic uh, development will actually uh, reach a, a situation of pacification of refugees and a depoliticization of uh, of their rights and kind of allow for a settlement. So I, I do agree. Yeah, definitely with that. Great, thank you. Uh, we've got another question here from William Hamilton, who says, while I do not dispute the general drive of your remarks regarding the colonial nature of Zionism in Palestine and the support by the British colonial authority, in your example, it seems that the British wanted to drain the area. I, I imagine he's talking about Batuv, uh, yeah. the area, which is pretty standard agricultural improvement practice very, very widely. It looks as if the removal of the water by the concrete canal was not colonial intent. Or have I misunderstood you on this? Was the water carrier project any part of the colonial legacy? No. No, yeah, again, for the sake of time, I, I might have rushed uh, explaining, you know, what happened. I, I kind of frame it as a colonial legacy because I see uh, Israel's uh, development of the national water carrier um, as uh, supported and empowered by uh, this colonial legacy, by the concessions that were given uh, to by the, by the British to Zionists uh, to uh, to change and transform and alter waterscapes, especially unwanted waterscapes like uh, like floods, like uh, the Hula swamps, like other uh, other big uh, thrust of land. Um, but what I what I have highlighted also is that the, the British also and Zionists did not always uh, see the same uh, or, or have the same idea for development for a certain area. In the case of Al Batuf, uh, the British uh, had an idea of of development for the sake of development, had the idea of like drainage for the sake of economic development that will lead to Arab satisfaction or at least specification uh, that you know that uh, that there is something there for them. Uh, for Palestinians who live in the area, while while for the Israeli, it was a very different uh, imaginary. But both of them are based on the same premise that these uh, that these waterscapes, that these water landscapes need to be altered. They need to be changed. They need to be they need to become modern. And that's what kind of brings the, what the legacy of colonialism that is very rife and very uh, very strong in in that case. So even if they diverged on the way that modernization is going to take place in Al-Battuf, both of them had the idea that Al-Battuf needs to be modernized, needs to be uh, uh, developed in a certain manner. I hope that clarifies. It does, although, you know, I happen to have been speaking about Battuf area a couple of days ago with a friend, and uh, uh, there are complaints about this, this uh, water logging issue there, and as though it's been ignored. So I... There are elements of Palestinian society that would that would claim to want uh, drainage, no? Sure. No, and this is yeah, definitely another another aspect of it, and another layer of the you know uh, of kind of the complexity of water projects. Like we cannot really claim that 
uh, Palestinians, uh, they are part of the modern uh, modernity. They also, the, the promise of infrastructure in Al-Battouf is very strong still and remains until today. While the decades have passed of, la of uh, deliberate inaction by the Israeli government to develop any sort of infrastructure in the Battouf, Palestinian farmers there see it as a way of staying on the land. We need drainage. Uh, the whole idea, and this will come in my uh, next uh, piece on Al Batuf, is actually kind of to cont contest with this idea of modernization belonging only to the colonizer, uh, and seeing you know the colonized, like Shirin Seqali has done in uh, in her book on men of capital. You know the idea that that we there is a promise of infrastructure, there is an in interest uh, by. Um, Palestinians to, to develop and to, to modernize. Uh, and we, I, when I looked at the archive, there were a lot of uh, instances, a lot of clear uh, demands to be included, even in the national water carrier, in the Israeli national water carrier. The idea is that we want to be connected, we want a drainage project, and we have plans to develop this drainage project. So I think the idea is, is to kind of go beyond, you know, this polarized idea of a romanticized uh, you know, um, valley that has no infrastructure, that is very much indigenous, and then the modern is always kind of reserved for uh, for colonial forces. And this is the interesting uh, case of Al Batuf, uh, and we can replicate that case across the West Bank, Gaza, and beyond, because we also see that quest for modernization in the water sector happening post Oslo as well. It, it doesn't stop. It's not just that one example, but many more. Yeah, I'd like to. Can you tell us a couple of those examples that you, that you mean by that? If you follow up to follow up there, yeah, is, that, is Wadi Gaza one of those projects? One of them. One of them is Wadi Gaza, and more is more related to also kind of um, the the treatment plants that have been heavily invested. The idea that you know we want to modernize the monoculture agriculture that is also expanding across the Jordan River basin. Uh, with the idea of, uh, you know, monoculture agriculture requires very large scale infrastructure, requires a, um, a modernist approach to water management. Uh, and and this, this has been kind of a, a request and a demand for uh, the Palestinian Authority. You know, we want to modernize, we want to go on that. But, and we also reject any, um, any kind of return to uh, to re-examine and to um, reintegrate our own tradition traditional knowledge uh, around water management for example uh, so there is kind of this contention where we are also seeking infrastructure but for the sake of, is it only for the sake of infrastructure or is it for the sake of uh, enacting sumud for example in certain areas uh, where infrastructure is not allowed so why do we emphasize, for example, a wastewater treatment plant in Deir Sharaf or other areas in the north of the West Bank uh, that are in Area C, while you know, while the demand and is for the, such development to happen, such infrastructure to be claimed in Area C. So this kind of idea that you know some uh, reclamation or some promise of infrastructure is fulfilled uh, because it suits the colonial realities we live under and other uh, and other uh, infrastructure are denied. Gotcha. Thank you. Again, I welcome folks to put in their questions in the question and answer feature at the bottom of the screen. We have one more question from Ahmed Fahoum, who asks or says the following, water in Palestine is very political. The recent paper published by Benny Morris and Benjamin Kedar on infecting wells to prevent the return of Palestinians, the building of settlements on former marshes and land reclamation pro projects, and reliance of Zionism on technological legitimacy to justify its raison d'etre. It's all about control, full control over the necessities of life for Palestinians. The evidence exists on how political water is out there Yet our voices remain weak and unheard. How can we break this gridlock? Yeah, Big, I uh, cluster comment. Go ahead. <laughs> no, it's it's a really a good one, and and definitely water is very political. I think on one hand uh, there is a, a tenden like not a tendency, but a systematic way of looking at water as a very technical and techno managerial issue that could should transcend you know uh, politics it should be part of you know uh, agreements such as abraham accords or any agreements uh, try multilateral agreements that are uh, happening uh, left and right these days uh, so 
that has always been the case. The, the depoliticization of water means the detachment of water from everyday life. The fact that you see it as a commodity, and this is part of this commodification and neo neoliberal understanding of uh, water uh, and our, our role uh, in, in the world in general. Uh, I, did, I didn't really look still at the paper. I have uh, heard that it's out and I'm, I'm really interested to have a look at it. But I think, yes, water has been uh, a tool uh, of, of war. Um, it has been used as a tool uh, to, to, to frighten, to, um, to push people away from areas. It is still uh, being used very clearly, you know, and systematically in, uh, in South Hebron Hills and the Jordan River, Bay, uh, in the Jordan Valley and in other areas, even inside uh, 48, when we talk about unrecognized villages and the denial of, of uh, connection to, to, in, to water infrastructure, for example, or to, um, uh, to electricity. Um, and, and it's definitely about, you know, control. I think uh, that's what uh, lends water its, uh, its importance and its multiple value and importance is that it affects everyday life. Uh, for me, I'm interested in how, how we see water as kind of a channel of identity and, and rights-based uh, cla claiming of uh, a rights-based identity and a place-based identity. And always uh, thinking about, you know, the audience, if some of them have been here or if the audience is originally Palestinian or Arab, uh, our detachment from our rivers and, uh, and water bodies. Uh, when we speak about the Jordan River, uh, imagine how we have seen it, how we see it as a border crossing, as a way uh, that is filled with, uh, you know, it's securitized, highly securitized water body, while a few, a few generations ago, it was a site of multiple meanings and values. Uh, that we have lost. We have lost that connection. So we have lost that importance of water. So that control, I, I think what Israel controls water, not just in its physicality and its immateriality, you know, it's not only uh, uh, exploiting uh, volumes of water, but it's also diminishing uh, a land-based identity of people and connection to the, for people with their land and resources. Uh, and if water for us Palestinians becomes transactional in the way we negotiate water rights, then we are kind of falling into that traps and into that colonial legacy, uh, because we are also not looking at water in its multiple meaning and values, uh, because it is at, at the heart of, of the struggle uh, um, over, uh, it's the heart of, of the struggle in Palestine, I think. Um, I don't know how we can break the, the gridlock, but I think uh, there are like a lot of interesting um, uh, trajectories that uh, water studies in general uh, on Palestine is taking that are very in, inviting, whether in literature, fiction, uh, and other avenues, uh, whether we talk about it in uh, political ecology and different, you know, uh, fields of uh, and schools of thought that go beyond, you know, international relations and hydrology and engineering. Uh, we need to make sure that water, just as just like land, is at the heart of, uh, of how we speak on Palestinian and Palestine and uh, justice in Palestine. So, uh, yeah, it's not a, uh, an answer, but just a reflection. No, I think a very uh, appropriate comment, especially in the context of uh, how we see, you know, major environmental issues sort of taking over the the globe, and particularly this region really suffering from from, from them. And it's almost become a trope that Jordan has become uh, is one of the most water dependent countries in the world. Is that correct? And yeah. in fact, can you actually correct me if I'm wrong here? Like I read an article in the Israeli press saying that. Uh, Israel actually provides a considerable amount of the water that Amman drinks. Is there a basis to this? Yes, <laughs> there is, uh, because again, uh, that that is also part of the kind of the pacification and depoliticization of, uh, of a lot of issues uh, concerning water, because if you link water to other very critical issues, uh, then you, you want to actually... Uh, you want to, to get your water. So you will maybe do more compromises and more kind of critical uh, issues and uh, political issues. Uh, so what happens also is that Israel, yes, through, through these uh, arrangements and agreements that have been happening uh, for decades now uh, between Israel and Jordan, 
on water, uh, there has been this idea, like as you've mentioned, this kind of unrealistic transfers between uh, between water bodies. Uh, so, so Israel takes the water of the of the Yarmouk, and then it gives back uh, Jordan some water from uh, Lake Tiberias, uh, and and all of these transactions happen to kind of allude to the fact that you know, if if water rights are uh, established then there is no need for all of these transactions and the problem is uh, when is is compound is further compounded when we hear of new agreements as if the old agreements are not bad enough that they have they take it take jordanians away from their water rights they leave them also uh kind of uh, very much shackled uh to uh, israeli pressure of cutting water off uh if required, uh, because of political stances, for example, that Jordan takes. So water is now implicated in that kind of uh, large political disputes. And uh, the solution has been uh, to, to do more agreements, uh, whether from between Israel and, the Pal and Jordanians or trilateral between Palestinians and Israel and uh, the Jordanians, like the, the Red uh, the Red Dead. Uh, conduit uh, that uh, a few years ago uh, was uh, on the highlight of the World Bank uh, proposal to again solve alleviate water stress, uh, but this water stress can be alleviated by very different uh, different means, uh, but not with new technologies and new sophisticated technologies that have detrimental effects on the environment and on political and the politics uh, of water management. Um, I, I, I want to give an opportunity to the audience members to actually understand better this Red Dead uh, plan. And excuse me if you said it when I was had my own technical difficulties. Uh, did you, by chance? No. No, you did not. So please, uh, no, please tell the audience about, about this uh, major infrastructure project that they were talking about, uh, that the World Bank was talking about for, quote unquote, revival of the Dead Sea. Exactly, kind of the idea that environmental degradation can be solved again with technologies uh, that we don't need to, you know, address underlying structural issues of why this degradation happened, how has, why did the, the, the Dead Sea, why is the Dead Sea dying, or why is the Jordan River in such a dire state that it's uh, really a trickle of uh, really wastewater, there's nothing else in it, why is the Yarmouk River uh, ending it doesn't continue even to where the Pinhas Rutenberg and the Naharayim uh, um, hydropower plant was, where I know the, the the gush of the water is not any anymore there. So I think one one thing with the Red Dead is another kind of way of uh, techno managerial uh, solutions of of the perceived water issues. Don't get me wrong, there are a lot of water issues in, 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 the, in the region. Jordan is one of the one, number one or one of the most scarce water country, water, uh, water scarce countries in the world. Uh, but it is all due to um, first to mismanagement, second to colonialism, uh, and third to this kind of infatuation with technology and technological solution, rather kind of, uh, you know, uh, addressing issues of injustice uh, and uh, issues of uh, giving people and, and countries uh, their rights, uh, to, to their share, their rightful share in their resources. Um, so the Red Dead has been uh, included as a solution where desalination happens at the Red Sea and through the very complicated systems uh, and the brine goes to the Dead Sea to raise it. Uh, and I will not get into the technicalities because you can read about it, uh, but it was such a, a, a very, a very expensive, unattainable project uh, that they have settled for a very small and micro, um, a micro type of project that is operational today. Um, and, and the fact that continues that this even, this Red uh, Dead Sea uh, project also has uh, a legacy, a historical legacy of colonialism. It can also trace back to Zionist aspirations of, uh, you know, increasing water availability to make the Zionist uh, uh, Zionist home or Jewish home in Palestine uh, with abundant water resources. The whole kind of idea is to increase water availability while maintaining control, while continuing over exploitation of the resources, I, while continuing territorial hegemony. Uh, over those resources. Um, so yes, it is one of those projects that uh, also offer, you know, economic uh, 
this idea of economic peace, you know, the idea that this is a win-win situation for everyone, where Palestinians need to get involved, although Palestinians mm. don't have access to, to the Dead Sea, uh, and still large parts of it are, are, are we cannot really even reach, and not, uh, nevertheless uh, exploit uh, in, in those terms. Um, so uh, this kind of brings us to another field of environmental peace building that is also very and dangerous and uh, has uh, um, yeah has been growing a lot because of international attention to it and a lot of capital being coming into it as well. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure if you you know about it, the, uh, but the the initial plan and it's actually mentioned in one of the annexes for Oslo was to have build the canal from the Red Sea to the Dead Sea to re elevate its water levels there. But then to have a second canal from the Dead Sea to Gaza, to uh, I don't know uh, for and and this de facto would have actually resulted in an alternative route uh, uh, to to the Suez Canal, actually, if you think about it. So it has geopolitical <laughs> significance sure. as well, not just techno politics and all that and and water sure. availability, so to speak. Yeah, and we see it as well with the, the new Abraham Accords and the way that they're also trying to link green energy and the idea of solar panels uh, with water kind of, okay, will Jordan will, will produce its, uh, its energy from solar panel and it will get more water from it. So kind of all of this the interdependencies that it creates uh, makes sure that any, uh, that in the environment itself is a site of colonial uh, abstraction. You know, even that uh, is a site of a colonial, it continues to be, of course it has been, uh, but even ways in which we find, uh, you know, desalination as an alleviation of, you know, uh, water scarcity, let's say, or uh, solar panels as an alleviation of uh, the dire situation of, let's say, communities in Masafir Yatta. But even those infrastructures are now being somehow <laughs> taken away and given the, that colonial stance, you know, that uh, environment is is just a colonial project, uh, nature, natural resources, another colonial uh, frontier uh, for extraction. Yeah. Uh, I'll ask you one, one last question before, uh, before we sign off, but, uh, you know, the basis of this lecture series is about British, uh, the, the, the centenary of the British mandate period. And uh, uh, we've spoken a lot about what Israel has done and its infrastructure and whatnot. Can you speak about uh, the actual legacy of British colonial water po management policies and how, where and how the Israelis took it from what they were inherited? And what is the legacy of that, so to speak? I was cutting to feet, but I'm thinking you're asking about uh, where is the British? Yes, I, I I want to I want to bring it back to the origins of what this lecture series is about, which is yep. to deal with the centenary of, of of the mandate period. Now, a lot of this discussion has focused on what Israel has done as a colonial practitioner of and and how it's dealt with water, water infrastructure, water politics, hydropolitics. Uh, I, I what yep. I want I, what I want to hear from you is how would you sum up the legacy of British colonial water policies and how Israel diverged or converged with these policies. Can you can you sum that up for us? Yeah, I think I think definitely the, the, the basis of what we see today in Palestine in terms of two main strands, the law regulations on water policy making has its roots in the colonial and the British colonial mandate. It has, uh, it has been uh, taken and uh, expanded on uh, to, to favor, uh, to favor uh, Zionist and Israeli water, water uh, projects. Uh, we see it today in the way, so in terms of law, law remains uh, that of the British times that they also uh, um, adapted and changed from the, from the Ottoman. So that, that terms of legacy, the legacy of favoritism, I think is really important here that, uh, you know, uh, in terms of who develops what, uh, what, water, infra what water infrastructure, uh, what types of uh, water policies uh, were pushed, uh, were pushed uh, only water policies that, um, 
that conformed to, to the imaginary, uh, to this Eurocentric, this very much colonial imaginary of uh, how water should be developed. So that continues, the, the legacy continues in the nation states as well. So not only in the way Israel as a colonial state operates uh, and manages uh, and exploits Arab water, but also in the way Arab countries themselves do, do that. Uh, leading to kind of more compounded and very much uh, inefficient uh, management in a very uh, in in a in a in a very uh, critical time of uh, global uh, global climate uh, emergency and crisis. You know, uh, in in a, in a time of uh, in, in heightened migration and increased warfare. Uh, you know, I think uh, you see that. So it's not only Palestine, but also other places where the British uh, mandate. Um, colonized. Uh, so I think that's in one hand. And the second hand is infrastructure, because infrastructure endures and infrastructure does not does not go away in a decade or two. Infrastructure stays and infrastructure concretized and it becomes uh, normalized. So uh, so it's, it's not really surprising that uh, Palestinian uh, authorities or governments will also want to kind of build on that colonial, uh, a modern water uh, kind of in, in vision, because this is how, this is the legacy that remains. So the legacy that remains is multi-layered and is complex. Uh, and it kind of also comes, uh, it's not only material, but also in the way we, uh, we imagine uh, our role uh, in society and our role in, uh, in the struggle uh, in the Palestinian struggle as well. So, uh, so I see I see it as a very much uh, a very multi-layered and very complicated and really um, rich. Uh, it required rich ethnographic, uh, yeah, uh, understanding. Sure. Uh, I, I think that comes out in, in your presentation and in your answers. Uh, William Hamilton, who asked the previous question, uh, uh, one of the previous questions sort of, I'm going to give them opportunity to, for his follow-up question he, where he asks simply, are you saying that all development is colonial misdeed? Uh, and I think, uh, yeah, he wants to challenge you on this. So uh, what would you say to William? I think it's an important challenge that we should reflect on ourselves as practitioners, as scholars, and as uh, as people who uh, inhibit the earth that we live on. Uh, maybe I'll take it a bit further into other uh, areas that I'm interested in in re my research, is yes, to uh, kind of uh, look at the uh, coloniality of development and uh, expose what the ramifications, what impacts it has on our, view, our views of the world. Uh, which type of knowledge do we uh, think of as legitimate? Which type of knowledge is uh, has more weight and has more value and which type of, of knowledge do we dismiss or disregard what can we do to actually bring about a more pluralistic type of development that takes into account other worldviews uh, that are not really dominant by uh, by, by a colonial worldview uh, you know in the climate change um, sector i call it a sector but in the climate change sector we see that kind of realization and acknowledgement of uh, that colonialism is is kind of the, is the reason we are in this mess today that we have to kind of confront that reality not as a historical pro event in the past but something that we are we still kind of are, are living under in different forms and ways so british colonialism might have ended in its uh, you know uh, kind of territorial type of colonialism but it continues in different ways in green energy in green economy uh, in in development in the development sector uh, and I'm sure, you know, there are many uh, who have who are questioning and who are critiquing development uh, approaches. So, so I think yes, we have to start from that uh, argument and expose it further. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, and we have. I'm going to give one last question to Tarak Tel, who has a follow-up question, which I think is quite important. He says, given our discussion of refugees in the Eastern Ghor, the Red Med project, and the fact that the Rutenberg scheme also gave the PEC, the right to all Jordan River tributaries following from the East Bank. Now, here comes the question. Is a Palestine-only framework the right one to address hydro-colonialism in the southern Bilad sham uh, No, no, it's not. I, I would like, it's not, it should be wider than that. Uh, Hydro-colonialism extends beyond uh, Palestine. I think the case of Palestine is a case where, you know, it, uh, colonialism and uh, 
extended and endured and uh, settler colonialism expanded. So this is why we see the connections, but I always frame you know, our work uh, with the University of East Anglia on the hydropolitical baseline of the upper Jordan River and the Yarmouk River basins uh, as in that framework, uh, trying to kind of bring together the the understanding that hydrocolonialism is not uh, is is a Bilad sham uh, reality, you know, uh, it 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 uh, developed in different ways in different countries, but uh, it still uh, endures. And uh, I encourage people to uh, target and other to uh, to look at the, those hydropolitical baselines because do they do have a very extensive historical overview where we looked at uh, we exposed a lot of uh, the, that inherent and embedded colonialism in the way we what manage and think and produce legislation about water in Bilad but uh, definitely a great, great point. Thank you. You have been listening to Dr. Muna Dejani speaking about thirsty water carriers, the legacy of colonialism in the Galilee. Uh, this has been a CBRL webinar, uh, part of the second in a larger series on the centenary of the British mandate in Palestine. Please go to our website at www.cbrl.ac.uk, where you can sign up to see more of our activities and events. Uh, the third uh, following lecture that is coming up in this series is in two days with Matthew Hughes talking about Britain's pacification of Palestine during the 1936 rebellion. That's based on his new book from Cambridge University Press, a 500-page study of the 1936 rebellion uh, using archival material to go through uh, a, a British military archival material. So very looking forward to that talk. As I said, check out our website. And thank you very much for attending this webinar. And thank you especially to Dr. Dejani for all her insight and time today. So with that, without further ado, please have a good evening and uh, be well, folks. All the best. Take care.